Good evening. On behalf of KPCC and LAS, welcome to Film Week and Chill, a virtual book club of sorts, but with movies. Tonight, we'll be taking off with Airplane. I'm John Cohn, and I manage live programming and events for KPCC and LAS. And while we look forward to the return to in-person events, we're very pleased that you've joined us online this evening. All of the programming you hear on KPCC and see on LAS is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you to all of you. If you're not already a member and you're in a position in which you can give, you can visit us online at support.kpcc.org slash in person. And while you're there, if you want to stay up to date on upcoming events, both virtual and in person, please sign up for our events newsletter. Throughout tonight's event, I invite you to engage with us and your fellow attendees in the chat section, and don't be shy about sharing your airplane questions, thoughts, your favorite quotes. Larry and guests would really love to hear those. That is, after all, part of the fun and kind of what like book clubs are all about. So for questions, let us know your name and where you're joining us from. Without further ado, the host of Southern California's longest continuously running daily talk program, Air Talk and your host for the evening, Larry Mantle. John, thank you so much. It's wonderful to come your way this evening from the studio where I host Air Talk and Film Week daily right here on KPCC. Tonight, I am so looking forward to talking about one of my favorite films of all time. This whole series was developed with the idea of giving us a break from the heaviness of the past 15, 16 months, the pandemic, of course, the tremendous loss around it and the upheaval in our lives. And of course, the political tumult that's been a part of our world as well. So unlike our in-person series that we have been doing for the past several years at the historic Theater at Ace Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, those films devoted to movies with a Los Angeles connection, this series are fun movies. Last one we did uh, was The Incredibles. We had terrific turnout and participation. Writer, director Brad Bird and composer Michael Giacchino and Film Week critics joined us for that event. Speaking of Film Week critics, I'm so pleased to have with us Christy Lemire and Tim Cogshell, who will be our critics representing Film Week tonight, giving their impressions of Airplane and where they think the film stands in terms of its influence on uh, comedies that would follow, the importance of it as, as a film and its influence on, on the whole genre of parodies. With us to talk Better about Airplane as well, are uh, the creative trio responsible for the film. Jim Abrahams, David Zucker, Jerry Zucker are with us. We're so pleased to have Robert Hayes, star of the film, Lorna Patterson, star of the film, to talk about it as well. And Joel Thrum, the casting director. We have a lot to ask him about there with, with the uh, uh, fantastic casting of the roles that we see in Airplane. So uh, we'll take your questions a little bit later. Uh, and let's uh, start first with our very first clip from Airplane from 1980. Hey, Larry, where's the forklift? Look out! It's over there, with the baggage loader! And that's where we know we're watching a totally different film here. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jerry and David and Jim for, for joining us. Either one of the three, just feel free to, to uh, jump in, but uh, Jerry and David, that's that's you in, in that scene. What do, you, what do you think when you look back on that? I, I, we haven't changed a bit. It's, just, <laughs> it's amazing how well preserved we are, really. I think of uh, what we actually did that bit on stage. And uh, our, in our longtime writing partner, Pat Proft actually wrote that. You say on stage, was that at your Kentucky Fried Theater on yes. Pico? Right. We did a, a, a live show on Pico for about five years in the 70s. And, and we should talk about, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jim. Telling as David and Jerry's performances were, if you look at when the airplane comes into the terminal, crashes through into the terminal, one of the people sitting in the crowd in front of the airplane is a woman holding a baby, actually just a doll. And she 
throws it and runs for cover. <laughs> and she kind of steals the scene. <laughs> yeah, it's a, great, it's a great scene. Well, let's talk about Kentucky Fried Theater because um, my understanding is you um, were spoofing commercials, you recorded late night TV commercials. Is that how the, the disaster film Zero Hour came to your attention, the, the film that spoofed an airplane? Yes, we'd be, we'd be recording on our reel-to-reel half-inch video uh, overnight, we just to get the you know all the bad commercials so we could spoof them. And then one morning when we uh, cleared off the machine, we uh, we found it. it there's this movie, uh, 1957 black and white disaster movie called Zero Hour, and we thought, oh my, this is hysterical, be unintentionally funny, but it had a great plot and it's the same plot as Airplane. And we thought, well we could just recast this with <laughs> great actors. like, And we immediately thought of Robert Stack. You did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The others came later, but- uh, There was actually there was actually a line in Zero Hour that we used directly that said, we need to find someone who not only can fly this plane, but who didn't have fish for dinner. So that you just took that from Zero Hour script. Correct. I, 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 I will say Zero Hour, we were very lucky because Zero Hour actually had a great plot. You could teach film structure using Zero Hour. I mean, it, it was just, I mean, and and if you haven't seen Zero Hour, it's identical to Airplane, you know, a, a, a passenger who's uh, had a, a bad experience in the war. Uh, I mean, at that point, there had actually been a war um, and and couldn't, you know, was forced to fly down the plane. Uh, and 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 it actually, if you look at it, each beat, it's it it it's really well plotted, which was a huge advantage. And it took us years after airplane to learn that lesson. Actually, now did you actually write this before your sketch film Kentucky Fried Movie came out? Was this in the works previously? Yes, we wrote it in 1975. And, and, you know, we took a, probably a year uh, to write it. And uh, we wrote it in the little dining room above the theater in our apartment where we live. And we, but we couldn't find any backing. So uh, that's why we did uh, Kentucky Fried Movie. Because John Landis came to see the show. He said, why don't you do a, a movie of your show? And that's what we did. And it turned out to be a great sequence of events because we actually learned how to direct from, uh, from you know, from watching John. And, what was, and it turned out we really needed to direct airplane. Well, and, and explain why, David, and how it worked having three directors. Because at that point, I don't think you could even get a, a credit, could you, from Directors Guild for three directors? Well, yeah, well having three, three directors direct is really just like not that big. Then you, you know, because the three of us just would always talk you, about the way we do down. it. And it's the same so it's, thing. It's totally smooth. Yeah, I can <laughs> yeah. see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, the uh, Directors Guild at first didn't, uh, would not give us permission to share credit. So in fact, I went to the courthouse and chained downtown and ch had my name legally changed to Abrahams and Zuckers. That was actually my legal name for a period of time. And we went back then and we, we won. Actually, the vote was tied in Gil Cates who uh, was the acting uh, president, because whoever was the president wasn't there that day, voted in our favor and we got the credit. I love it. So I changed my name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Yes. To, to Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> what, so you had the success of, of the three of you writing Kentucky Fried Movie, John Landis directing, and did that give you entree with Airplane or was, was, that still a, was it still a tough sell? No, it, it was still it was still a very tough sell. We tried to pedal it all over town, and the fact that we insisted on directing was there were people who were willing to buy the script, but for three guys who'd never directed anything, uh, who'd only been on a movie set once, and had this outrageous idea about casting straight actors and comedians, it it was a tough sell. Not to mention the fact that we were not very impressive in meetings. <laughs> yeah, well, take, take this meeting for example. Yeah. How, how did how did the three of you team up? Uh, we were 
we were friends from Milwaukee. Uh, actually, our, our fathers were business partners. Our sisters were uh, college roommates. Our mothers were friends. And uh, we just kind of, uh, and, and Jerry and I were brothers. So, we, we, you know, we just kind of got together. Uh, after I graduated from college, Jim was working in Milwaukee as a uh, private investigator. And Jerry was a senior in college at, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, I, I, I uh, managed to borrow some videotape from my, uh, my dad's friend. And we just thought we'd start a theater. We hooked up with another guy named Dick Chudnow. And uh, we, we combined a live, live skits with the videotape on stage. And, and that became Kentucky Fried Theater. And do, from the beginning, did you find your humor meshed well, or was that a matter of, of, of spending a lot of time together that it came, it congealed? I, I think it really just meshed well. I don't think we thought about it then, really, because this was just a lark. We, we didn't think about going to Los Angeles or making a living out of it. We were just, we were just having fun, but we, we really did have a singular sense of humor. We, you know, we would disagree about some things, but our, our I mean, I, I would never suggest three guys direct the movie together, but we, we did have one vision and that's why we were able to do it. And so our, our discussions uh, uh, between takes were just problem solving. They, they weren't our, the kind of movie we were intending to make. Yeah, they, one, one of the things that we shared was that we didn't want to do political humor. And it was during the time of Vietnam and, you know, assassinations and a, and a pretty rough time in American history. And we instinctively, it's not like we said, hey, we're going to stay away from that. But we just sort of instinctively chose to make fun of movies and commercials and stuff instead. And the other singular idea was doing it without comedians. And right from the beginning, we wanted to cast Robert Stack, you know, Lloyd Bridges, uh, Peter Graves, and later Leslie Nielsen. Well, and uh, you, you perfectly anticipated, I was just going to ask you about that. So you have the idea of Robert Stack, Elliot Ness from the Untouchables, ultra straight arrow, super serious, and with the voice that goes with it. Um, then was it picturing him that you thought, well, let's do a whole you know, a whole series of characters with similar sorts of resumes and, and that in and of itself is funny? It was all the characters at once, as I remember. Uh, it, because we were, we were watching Zero Hour and so we wanted it to look just like Zero Hour, um, uh, you know, and that, and really very much we were making fun of a 1950s, 60s style of acting where they were, you know, the actors really took themselves seriously and they had two speeds on and off. <laughs> and, 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 and so it, it, at some point we just sort of said, Hey, why don't we cast it like that? I mean, those, those four roles. If you actually, if, if you're ever bored or your audience is ever bored, you can Google zero hour airplane and you can see the scenes between zero hour and airplane intercut with each other and uh i mean we even use the same camera angles yeah everything's on google that's terrific yeah, someone right. took the time to put the, that together the, gentlemen I'll, I'll, I'll oh i'm sorry jerry no, I was just saying saying the, the tricky thing was um getting the actors not to just kind of play it straight because everybody thinks they're playing it straight when they're not but to get them to act as though they didn't know they were in a comedy. And that's what we kept repeating. And, and we, kept, we kept saying another take, do it straight, don't be funny. And that's hard for someone in a comedy and to, uh, yep. just to not be funny. Yeah, and Leslie Nielsen, who eventually became the best at it, at the first table read, uh, you guys probably remember, he put a little spin on it, I think. Yeah, and so we actually sent him home with a video with a VHS of Zero Hour, and he watched it, and and he came back the next day and had it hundred percent. He had wow. that doctor down. And that's that's great. Did, did any of them have to be persuaded to do this because of um, the nature of the comedy in the film and the fact that they were known for these very straight arrow kinds of roles? We were very fortunate 
in that Howard Koch uh, was the executive producer of, of the movie. And Howard was an esteemed Hollywood figure. He had been uh, president of the Motion Picture Academy. And so he was sort of our advocate uh, approaching a lot of these guys. Peter Graves, for instance, evidently threw the script across the room when he read it. He thought it was so tasteless. But <laughs> Howard um, kind of helped persuade all those guys that we had a, a legitimate vision and this could be a lot of fun. The only one that loved it right from the beginning was Leslie because he was, Leslie was a closet comedian. It's, you know, looking back now, it's not amazing that Leslie was so funny in a, in a movie, but but then he did all those serious movies all those all those years. Yeah, well, and what a career rebirth for him, becoming a movie star, uh, not just a character actor because of, mm -hmm. of his ability with that. Uh, let me bring Robert Hayes, star of the film, into the conversation. Bob, thank you so much uh, for joining us from Hawaii, particularly. Uh, appreciate. Um, you were doing a network uh, television sitcom at the time, weren't you? And was this yeah. done during hiatus of the show? I was doing a show called Angie at the time and uh, which was on the same lot. And um, when the hiatus came up between the seasons, it was a mid-season replacement. The first was a half season and then we were picked up for the second season. And we began filming during that four week hiatus that we had or five weeks, I think it was. And it overlapped by two weeks at the end of it. So I was doing both of them at the same time for the last two weeks of airplane. Yeah, that must have so. been exhausting to, to be working on, on both simultaneously. So when, I, hadn't, when, I hadn't been that tired up to that point. I hadn't been that tired yet in my life. I can that, was, uh, that was fun. Well, and, and the film is so demanding. When you read the script for the film, what, what, what were your thoughts? I was on an airplane. I was flying to Minneapolis with Donna Pescow, who was in Angie. She played Angie. And we were flying with Howard Cosell and a bunch of ABC people to Minneapolis for the changeover of a TV station from NBC to ABC. And there was something on every single page that made me laugh out loud, made some noise come out, not just a, your smile at it. I mean, something made me laugh out loud every page. It was great. And and uh, we experienced, uh, I've had pulling the, the clips of the film and the, and the like, when you were making it, did you have a sense this is going to be something really special? The audience is going to love it, or or did you have any doubts as you were filming it how it would play in a theater? I thought that it was as we went along. I thought, wow, you know, this thing really has got a chance to be one of those cult classics on college campuses, and that's what I was thinking. And then as it went along. And the guys were coming back from the dailies and John Davison, the producer on the show was telling me, he, he said, oh, it looks bad. It's bad. I said, what do you mean it looks bad? He said, the dailies are too good. That's bad. That's bad. And I said, what? And he said they have to play it over and over because all the people, you know, uh, I guess a lot of times there's some shows they have other things they have to do. They say, well, tell me what the dailies look like. And, but with this one, everyone wanted to see them and they had to show them over and over. But, uh, it got to the point where we started feeling like, wait a minute, this might actually be more, but we didn't want to say it out loud. And we were standing around a group of about five of us and a young kid that was a day player came up and he said, hey, here, this thing's going to be really great. And we all turned and walked away from it. So it was just kind of not wanting to put the hex on it. It started feeling like it was something kind of special. And then you just forget about that and just keep focusing on the work. Let's uh, let's see uh, one of the scenes from the film that you're in. Uh, Tony, let's uh, look at clip number three here. Robert Hayes, traumatized ex-fighter pilot turned cab driver, Ted Stryker. In this flashback within the film, uh, his girlfriend, Elaine Dickinson, played by Julie Haggerty, visits him in a psychiatric hospital. I found a wonderful apartment for us. It has a brick fireplace and a cute little bedroom with mirrors on the ceiling and... Right later, right later, I'm going down! Captain Jolene. 
He thinks he's a pilot still fighting the war. I found the tunnel, Johnson. It's this way. Twenty five dollars for a cigarette is too much. Oh. 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 What's his problem? It's Lieutenant Hurwitz. Severe shell shock. Thinks he's Ethel Merman. You'll be swell. You'll be great. Gonna have the whole world on a plate. Starting here, start now. Honey, everything's coming up. War is hell. Well, we'll get to <laughs> Ethel Merman's casting in a moment. But um, Bob, uh, working with Julie Haggerty, you know, I'm so impressed. Her timing, her ability with physical comedy, you know, and this was her first feature film, right? right. What was it like both working for with both her? of us? Oh, both of us. Your, it okay. was our first, yeah. I didn't been doing television, but uh, and she, so I had more experience in front of the camera than she had. Uh, she'd been a model and had done an off, 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 off Broadway show, I think. But uh, I was lucky in that I got to test with Julie. So, uh, and I just love working with her and Lorna. I mean, this is, this is the, the, these folks are incredible. Just the most talented folks you can imagine. So I lucked well, out. I yeah, coasted well, on their goat coattails. Well, you had great chemistry, the two of you. And I, I want to go back to Jerry, David and Jim. Um, did you sense when they were testing that they had that, that chemistry? They were definitely our favorites and that's why we tested them together. So, I mean, Bob thinks he was fortunate, but we knew he was the guy. Well, actually, it was, it's funny because Julie, we knew instantly. She came in at the beginning and we were just like, we couldn't believe how perfect she was. But uh, the part of Ted Stryker, people kept coming in. We just, we, we didn't think the lines were funny because they just weren't, it, it, it just wasn't happening. And uh, until I think it was, uh, uh, Bob, was it your agent, Beth Voitke or something, who no. walked into Howard Koch's office with a photo and he said, oh, sure, I don't care, bring him in, you know? And, <laughs> and, and Bob read and we all like, it is funny. <laughs> and we were, uh, you know, very fortunate because Bob, in, in addition to the way he plays the character and reads the lines, those looks he give often after a line or when someone else says, Leslie says something funny and Bob kind of gives this, I can't do it, but yeah. this look, and, and that's what gets the laugh. Well, and, and it's interesting because that subject came up recently. Bob, why don't you explain what you're, because this is not a direction we gave Bob, but why don't you explain your well, point of view reacting to the jokes and stuff? I remember, well, I, I had a couple of thoughts about it. One was that I felt like I was the only sane person surrounded by all these weird, goofy, out of whack, you know, people. And when they would say things like, for instance, in, uh, in the cockpit, when Lorna and Leslie are sitting there and they said, uh, uh, you know, can you fly this? I think it was the first time it says, can you fly this plane? Surely you can't be serious. I'm sure there's no goalie sure that was the first time he says that. And he says, can you fly this plane? And I said, well, I flew single, single engine fighters in the war, but that had four engines. It's an entirely different kind of flying <clears throat> altogether. And altogether, they say it's an entirely different kind of flying. When they said that, I just kind of raised my eyebrow. I looked at it like, that's odd. And that was my reaction. And I think that um, the, the boys came back after watching dailies and they said, did you know your eyebrow raised up when you, they didn't see it during the shooting, but in the dailies they saw it. And I said, Oh yeah. But, well, it, it's, that, but that is the thing that gets the laugh. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the line is funny, but it's so odd. You're, you're not quite sure until you see Bob's reaction. I, I, it was, I, think, I felt like I was representing the audience's point of view as, yeah. Yeah. And that's a great point. I think the other thing is from from my perspective, the viewer, Bob, is that um, you're in this state of, of despair and and, you know, you've lost who you are because of this tragic event. But there's that sense that you give of that of being redeemable, that that if if just you can find yourself again, you can be saved. And I think it's that sort of walking that edge is very effective in the character also very yeah. endearing. And Bob, as an actor, actually was, 
uh, conscious of those things. We we didn't we just cared about the joke, and <laughs> and so we you know so we we learned a lot. Bob had all these theories that were correct, and uh, and it was a good thing he did. So let's bring Lorna into the conversation. Uh, Lorna Limbeck Patterson at, at the time of the film, flight attendant Randy. And early on, we find out there's not only a singing nun on board, but flight attendant Randy has quite a voice. Let's hear. Do you mind if I talk to your daughter? Well, I think that'd be nice. Hi, I'm Randy. And Lisa. Oh, you have a guitar. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe you'd like to hear a song. I'd love to. Okay. Let's see. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I traveled the banks of the river of Jordan To find where it flows to the sea I looked in the eyes of the cold and the hungry and I saw that I was looking at me And I wanted to know if life had a purpose And what it all means in the end In the silence I listened to voices inside me And they told me again and again There is only one river there is only one sea, and it flows through you, and it flows through me. There is only one people, we are one and the same. We are all one spirit, one name. We are the Father, we are one. We are one. Lorna, thanks, thanks so much. When when you were cast for the film, was the song and you singing it was that part of the deal, or were you cast before that? No, I was cast before that, and I had the part, and I was I was happy. I was happy. I was satisfied. And then um, I don't remember the events, but I got a call um, or I, a, from or a thing on my beeper. Remember that uh, my pager um, that uh, there was some problem with the nun singing and could I sing? And you know my agent said, "Can she sing? Yeah, she can sing." And so I ran to um, the studio, and um, we got there. And I realized I had a cassette tape of you know my voice lessons or something, but they didn't have a cassette player in their office, and I didn't think to bring one. So we went out to Jerry's car. And I auditioned in the back seat of Jerry's Volvo. <laughs> that is the truth. But there true are little Hollywood faces. Story. <laughs> it's a true Hollywood story. Yes. So you must have thought after you heard her audition, hey, wow, um, you, you really lucked out in the casting that she had that kind of voice. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you wanted, your original thought was to have the nun who's played by Maureen McGovern do, do uh, the song, is that right? Yeah, Universal <laughs> wouldn't let us do that. We were coming too close. You gotta be, there's specific rules in parody and you're allowed to use some characters and occasional dialogue, but that was too close to the airport movie the Universal made. So at the last minute, we had to switch. The other thing that's sort of interesting about that song is it was written by Peter Yarrow. And Peter, you know, I grew up on Peter, Paul, and Mary. I love them. Mm -hmm. But Peter Yarrow never read the script. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he, he kind of thought, you know, he was writing that song from his heart. And then he saw the movie <laughs> and he was, am I allowed to say pissed off? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay, he was. It, but it, we always, in recalling that, it's important to remember, he did take the chat. Yeah, <laughs> Lorna, what was it like uh, filming your your scenes in, in the movie and describe? Because it, it was obviously very fast paced. You, you know, I I was very young. Um, this was one of my first jobs. Joel can tell you, Joel can attest to that. Yeah. I think I was very early twenties. I was just so happy to be 
I was on a lot. I was in a movie. I was with a wonderful people. I got to sit next to Howard Koch. And, you know, I just, I was just so happy to be there. And whatever Jerry told me to do, I was, I was, I wanted, I just wanted to please them. That's really, um, and it was just so fun. It was such a happy place. I never in my life of show business and life, I never had another experience that happy and fun it was just a great place to be yeah, i remember it was, it when was she's downhill for us too <laughs> <laughs> when when yeah. lorna says whatever jerry said to do jerry was out next to the camera right where you traditionally have the director and jim and david were back in the booth where they had a monitor and they could it was a watch tiny the tra- it was a, yeah it, it was a little white trailer right like a yeah, little funny yeah. little little trailer yeah. or something right yeah, yeah. And they'd have it on when we were on location and then in, they put it in the studio inside and they could see it taped off so they could see exactly what would be on the screen. So if something didn't get in that they wanted in or if something came in, they didn't want in and they could tell Jerry. But the, but it was it was funny for me when they were you were asking about the three directors. It was like uh, seeing three bodies with one head because they would one would start a sentence. One would say the middle and the other would finish the sentence. And it was the same thought. And so there was never a problem. It was just, you were hearing the whole direction they wanted in stereo, you know, and triple stereo. And it was great. It was oh, fun. Yet, it, well, you see this energy this evening as well. Lorna, how was the character described to you? What, what the role you were playing? Um, uh, the other stewardess? Um, <laughs> I think that's basically it. The, the, the other one, the spare. <laughs> And of course, they named her Randy, which you know we all we all know what that means, except in America. So um, I don't know. They, I, I, I just got on my, I put on my uniform and my little wings, and ready to be uh, stewardess number two. And you get your break. You get your breakdown scene also uh, about the unmarried uh, scene as well. So. I was just going to say that Lorna has, I think, our all three of our favorite line in the movie which is, I'm, you know, I, I'm 26 and I'm not married. And then, but at least I've got a husband. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, the other woman Lee says. The other, the other woman, woman says. says Lee Brian, yeah. Yes. But, and then yeah. she breaks down, but, and then Lauren breaks down crying. <laughs> so uh, for some reason. Lauren did a great job of listening to that great line. <laughs> well, no, her reaction to it is what gets the laugh, you know, so anyway, it's great. But, Lorna, um, <laughs> You um, were you at all surprised by the uh, response to the film that, that people loved it so much and that it was such a financial success? It, yes, I mean it. It's a phenomenon, and it, I, I think it's just become more more of a phenomenon as the years have gone by. I mean, I, again, I just feel very fortunate that I got to play, that I got to be you know, on that playground with all of them that I got invited to the party. And um, and I've just always remained incredibly grateful for the experience. Let's watch another clip from the film. We've talked about Leslie Nielsen, the no-nonsense guys uh, who, who make up uh, so many of these important roles in the film. Uh, this is the scene where we meet Leslie Nielsen. Sir, excuse me, sir. I'm sorry I have to wake you. Are you a doctor? That's right. We have some passengers that are very sick. Could you come take a look at them? Yes. Yes, of course. Let me see your tongue. back in a minute. You'd better tell the captain we've got to land as soon as we can. This woman has to be gotten to a hospital. A hospital? What is it? It's a big building with patients, but that's not important right now. Tell the captain I must speak to him. Certainly. 
I love it. And Elmer Bernstein's music is so oh, yeah. perfect in, in that magic scene, uh, the tension, how he ratches it up. Um, what sort of direction did you give Bernstein on what you wanted in the score? We told him we, we, told him we wanted a score for a B movie. <laughs> you know, we, 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 nothing too good. No, Elmer, Elmer really got it. First of all, he, he cackled all the way through. And every time he saw a scene from the movie, he would just over and over again, he, he would cackle. He had this high pitched laugh and, and which was great, but, but we, we, he, he got it. We told him what we were doing. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, did we show him zero hour? I don't remember. But, but if he understood that we wanted that kind of cheesy, old-fashioned, uh, hard-hitting score. Yeah, yeah, we put a temporary score on it for the previews. But when we showed it to, to Elmer, they took all the music away. So he just saw the, the movie with no music, just with dialogue and effects. And <clears throat> he just laughed all the way through. Well, Joel, let me bring you in, casting director of the film, uh, Joel Thurm, uh, also worked on a number of other prominent films, including Grease and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. So we have Leslie Nielsen, Robert Stack, Lloyd Bridges, uh, Peter Graves, um, and, and of course, Ethel Merman. So with, with so many of these people that audiences know, but seeing them totally uh, out of the environment they would have been in before, was there much convincing that uh, you had to do? Well, uh, the convincing, as I was said before, was um, some of the, the, um, the, ca the characters who just didn't get it at first. You know, like Peter Graves, who, who just, you know, like you said, he threw the script across the room or something. But his kids, you know, said, Dad, this is really funny. And, you know, um, and, and they convinced him to do it. Um, and, you know, it, it's and I, I can't I wasn't there when they when they read their scripts. So I really don't know. But there was a little resistance. There was a lot of resistance for the just the two leads. I mean, I, I work on, 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 on movies that everybody doesn't get right away. The, the turndowns for, for Rocky Horror uh, and this for the, for the leading roles were enormous. Uh, yeah. you know, people just didn't get it by reading the script. What about um, Ethel Merman's cameo? Was there a list of other performers like that, that well, uh, if she had turned it down? Well, if she had turned it down, it's funny because that was my audition question when I first met the boys about getting the job. And the first question was, what about Ethel Merman? But I misinterpreted the question. I thought they said, basically, can we get Ethel Merman? And I said, well, duh, let's offer it to Ethel Merman. And then you guys said, you think she'll do it? And I used my line, yeah, she's in, in makeup and circling the building. Yes, she will do it. <laughs> but uh, understanding your, you later on when you said, well, what happens if it's not Ethel Merman? My two answers would have been Carol Channing <laughs> followed by Eartha Kitt. <laughs> because it's the same it joke. Is. I mean, you could see him in bed with a fur doing Stacey Bone, or you'd see Carol Channing in bed with a, head, with a headdress. So that was the joke. I just, I'm just glad I got the job, even though I didn't answer it correctly. <laughs> and and Merman clearly um, understands what she's what she's there to do. Did she have interaction with the rest of the film, or she just come in, do what you directed her to just, do in that just, scene? Yeah. That was, she she liked. She, yeah, her she, only proviso was she wanted her own hairdresser to do her hair. <laughs> and so she didn't she didn't want to come in till afternoon so her hairdresser could take care of her hair. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's when you when you when you go for somebody like that who is a, a, a huge huge star in a different area you have to fly them out as first classy as you can get get them the really nice hotel flower champagne and treat them the way they would be, you know, a star on Broadway. And she hadn't done many films so you know, uh, I cast her in Hello, Dolly in New York. She was the original choice, but wound up to be the last Dolly to play the role. And so I knew she would enjoy this and have a great time doing it. She so was let's... great. She was great, though. She was not. I, I mean, Joel is absolutely right about that's how you treat people. But I, I never got the impression from being with her I, I, that, that she 
that she required that, even though you, you, that is the way you no, handle it. You're right. She didn't require it, but it's always nice to be given that without asking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let's, let's, uh, let's see another one of the stars of the film, uh, Joel, that uh, you cast in the movie, Lord, Lloyd Bridges, uh, <laughs> whose recurring lines about his addictions are, I'm sure, uh, quoted around the world. This is Elaine Dickinson. I'm the stewardess. Captain Over's passed out on the floor and we've lost the co-pilot. Navigator 2, we're in terrible trouble. Over. Roger, Elaine. Roger, I read you. This is Steve McCroskey at Chicago Air Control. Back to you in a minute. Hold all takeoffs. I don't want another plane in the air. And the 508 reports, bring it straight in. Yes, sir. Put out a general bulletin to suspend all meal service on flights out of Los Angeles. Tell all dispatchers to remain at the post. It's going to be a long night. How about some coffee, Johnny? No, thanks. I want the weather on every landing field this side of the line, no matter what the size. You understand? Any place, any place where there's a chance to land that plane. Stan, go upstairs to the tower and get a runway diagram. Terry, check down the field for emergency equipment. Chief, we got fog right down to the deck, every place east of the Rockies. There's no possible place they can land. They'll have to come through to Chicago. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. I want the best available man on this. A man who knows that plane inside and out and won't crack under pressure. How about Mr. Rogers? Get me Rex Kramer. He's so perfect in that role. Joel, is it true that his sons, Bo and Jeff, had to convince him to do that role? A, a little bit, but I don't think too much. He was, I didn't know Robert Stack at all, um, but, I, but I knew Lloyd Bridges. I'd worked with him and I, I wanted to I cast something that Bo, Bo played Lloyd at a younger age. So uh, I, don't th- I don't know how much convincing he needed to do. He also had a great sense of humor and I thought he could go both ways. He could be very straight and he could also go a little crazy if that was necessary. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think he needed too much convincing, but you guys are on the set with him every day. You would know that more than I would. And, well, and David, Jim and Jerry, did, did you guess that that recurring joke, I picked a bad week, dot, 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 that that would become such a part of the culture? I, I, you know, I, I used that myself just when things were going wrong on a show we had just a week ago. <laughs> well, we, you know, we didn't generally guess that, you know, in 40 years, people would still be quoting it and the, the film would live that long. We did really believe that it would be a hit, mainly because we'd be, we had been telling people for five years, it's going to be a big hit, please finance this. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, some of the things that, that have become, you know, like Don't Call Me Shirley and uh, I Take It Black Like My Men, I mean, all those things. You know, we would go around say, saying it, but we didn't realize that everyone else would be too. And that's evidently what happened. And by the way, the, the line, I picked the wrong week, uh, quit smoking, was in, in zero hour. So we just took that and expanded. <laughs> and took it to the nth, nth degree, yeah. which we'll, we'll, see, we'll see more of that. Um, but let me bring into the conversation our critics, Christy and, and Tim. Um, Christy, what, what stands out most to you about the film? Well, I was about eight years old when it came out. And I look back at that now and think, man, my parents were permissive because <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> racy movie in retrospect. Um, but having watched it so many times since then, the thing that makes it timeless for me is the wordplay. Because you've got a lot of pop culture references. You've got a lot of slapstick. You've got some really amazingly clever little things going on in the background, like in that last clip with the two guys who were attached to the shoulder trying to tug each other. But the delivery, the deadpan delivery, and just the way it sneaks up on you, Leslie Nielsen especially, with you know things like, it's a big building with patients, but that's not important right now. Like versions of that kind of line over and over again are what really make this film timeless for me. Well, and, and to me, it's so influential, not that anyone has, has done parody in the same way. In fact, we don't, I don't think we see as much parody now. A Key and Peele certainly, you know, with, with their television show, did it beautifully. But it doesn't seem to me like we're in an era where where there's a lot of it. But this film um, raised the bar on 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 the spoof. I think, Christy. Well, it's so hard to do it well because I think a lot of parodies are like, here's a thing you know, and here's a thing you know, and here's another thing you know, and we're not going to do them. 
and you're gonna laugh out of recognition that should be enough theoretically, but it's really not. And so to find the balance that you guys all found here is, is so tough. And that's why you see so many films trying to recreate that magic and really none have. Also, I wanna say it's so fun watching you guys watch these clips because Bob is giggling and Jim's got the biggest goofiest smile on his face. And it's like, you're all watching it for the first time. And like your joy for this movie is infectious through your little Zoom boxes. <laughs> Uh, Tim, uh, you have a favorite part of this film? Well, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar uh, in that extremely meta scene uh, where he's playing uh, the co-pilot Roger Murtaugh, uh, who's not, who's actually Kareem. That's a, that's, that's a scene that we, and, and the jive talking scene, of course, I, we, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I got to tell you, guys, as I watch this movie, and I understand that, that you didn't want these actors playing these as comedic sort of roles, but, I, but I, am I wrong? And, and that I suspect you guys were all fans of the Marx Brothers. Do I detect some Marx Brothers fans, some Three yeah. Stooges fans, mm -hmm. maybe even a little W.C. Fields fans <laughs> in there? I'm a Midwest guy too. And I, and I think that, that that strain runs through us. Uh, would that be correct? We, we, absolutely, we're big Marx Brothers fans. Uh, we used to, uh, before, you know, they had the internet. I mean, when we were in college, they would have these film festivals where you'd have 600 stoned students in a room watching Duck Soup. And, you know, that really, and, and the zaniness of the Marx Brothers and the slapstick combined with the, the very witty wordplay had a definite effect on us. I mean, to a lesser extent, <clears throat> the Three Stooges, because they were only slapstick. Um, they didn't have the, the wit, which really transcended <laughs> that, all that stuff. Mad Magazine was also Oh a, man! A huge yeah. influence on us, and, yeah. and later uh, Woody Allen. When we saw what Woody Allen was doing in films like Bananas, we thought, okay, we can we can do this. We're on. We could be on this level. We have this thing. But our breakthrough was do, doing it without comedians. Did uh, Woody Allen uh, ever tell you he saw your film? He did. I I met him uh, some years ago. And it was at the, at the halftime of a Knicks game. And uh, I saw him and I went up to him and, and, and introduced myself. And, uh, you know, he immediately knew about me and Airplane. I was just, because he was our idol for so many years. And he said, and he told me about the first time he saw Airplane. It was in a screening, a pre-screening of it. And he was sitting next to the famous review, reviewer, Pauline Kael. And... Pauline Kale was not laughing at all. She hated it. And what he said, he was turning to her and saying, wait a minute, this is, this is really funny. This is brilliant. He got it, you know, this is funny. And she, uh, and later I think I, somebody showed me one of her reviews and it said, essentially there's not a comedian in the entire movie. So <laughs> got it. Yeah, yeah, she didn't. She didn't get it clear, didn't clearly. Didn't. Tim, you were. Uh, Tim, you were going to continue, and I'm sorry. I, and, go. I, I, I just wanted to say that I, I, I detected a, a direct through line from Airplane to the films in the black community, anyway. Robert Townsend's Hollywood Shuffle a few years later, uh, Keenan Ivory Wayne's uh, I'm Gonna Get You Sucker a few a few years later, yeah. right through to Keenan's films, uh, the the whole series of scary movie movies, scary movie parodies uh, that, that, that were based on that. I detect a through line right through all of those films influenced uh, primarily by Airplane, if I'm not mistaken. I, yeah, I, 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 I imagine you guys probably do too. I you know, it's, it's interesting. We, uh, we saw in 1975, you saw a movie called Shaft starring Robert Roundtree. Richard was, Roundtree, yeah. Yeah, Richard Roundtree. And it was what they call a black exploitation movie. And we liked it. And we walked out of the theater and we said, it's, it was good, but we couldn't understand what the actors were saying. And so we had this thought, well, what if we have these black guys on the airplane and subtitle them with stupid white guy subtitles? And when the when airplane came out, I wasn't sure, we weren't sure, is it was that going to be offensive or not. But we, when we went to see the movie with a black audience, they laughed harder than the white audience at this stupid white guy subtitles of what the black guys were trying to say. And we thought inadvertently, perhaps, we had tapped into the tone deafness of the white community to the whole black 
experience. Oh, Jim, uh, Tim, hold that thought, please, because let's show that scene. This is my favorite scene in a film that has so many scenes that I love. Mm -hmm. Can I get you something? Some more folk butter laying into the bone, jacking me up. Tight me. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Cuddy say can't hang. Oh, stewardess, I speak jive. Oh, good. He said that he's in great pain and he wants to know if you can help him. All right, would you tell him to just relax and I'll be back as soon as I can with some medicine? Just hang loose blood. She gonna catch up on the rebound on the med side. What it is, big mama? My mama didn't raise no dummies. I duck her rap. Cut me some slack, Jack. It's a cutting thing. She only says we say we're doing everything. Chomp the one to help. Chomp don't get the kill. Say can't hang. Say seven up. Jive ass dude don't got no brains in him. <laughs> well, it, it just adds to it that Barbara Billingsley, the mother of Leave It to Beaver, just pops up into the scene. I speak jive. You know, uh, what, just, you know what I just noticed is that when Lorna is saying, tell them that this, the, the characters, the guys don't understand what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lorna, it's great. I, I, love, I love that scene. Do, do you have a hard time keeping a straight face through that scene, Lorna? Through the entire movie. I mean, <laughs> yes. I mean, but you know, the guys were so serious about their comedy that it affected the actors in that, at least I, the, uh, what I saw is that everyone just sort of um, joined in with their seriousness and we wanted to, again, wanted to please them. And so I don't remember that there was a lot of breaking up. I think that we all were you know, sticking to the to the words and and trusting, trusting the guys. Well, and Tim, I've I've heard that generally about comedies. If the cast is laughing a lot, people are breaking up when the movie's being shot. Usually, it's not a funny film for the audience. <laughs> is that for Jim? Oh, Tim, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was saying, Tim, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of comedies, right, where we hear how everybody had such a great time making it. Ishtar being you know, the prime example of that. Well, I don't know. I like Ishtar, but we'll talk about that oh, later. Okay. Right. <laughs> that's a whole later. show. Okay. Here, here, though, yeah, I think I think that's exactly exactly what's going on. It's because of the way all of these characters are playing these things so straight, particularly Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I mean, yeah, I think Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had been in a, a Bruce Lee movie a little bit earlier uh, where, where he did some martial arts. But he, he played everything so straight. He nailed it. How did you get the 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 uh, seven foot three center for the <laughs> Lakers to nail that performance? How did you know he could do it? Let's hold that thought. We'll hear the answer after we watch that clip. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as co-pilot. We better get back now, Joey. No, Joey can stay here for a while if you'd like. Could I? Okay, if you don't get in the way. Our flight 209 to Denver Radio, climbing to cruise at 42,000. We'll report again over Lincoln. Over and out. Wait a minute. I know you. You're Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You play basketball for the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm sorry, son, but you must have me confused with someone else. My name is Roger Murdoch. I'm the co-pilot. You are Kareem. I've seen you play. My dad's got season tickets. I think you should go back to your seat now, Joey. Right, Clarence? Oh, he's not bothering anyone. Let him stay here. All right, but just remember, my name is Roger Murdoch. I'm an airline pilot. I think you're the greatest, but my dad says you don't work hard enough on defense. And he says that lots of times you don't even run down court. And that you don't really try, except during the playoffs. The hell I don't. Listen to you. I've been hearing that crap ever since I was at UCLA. I'm out there busting my buns every night. Tell your old man to drag Walton in the near up and down the court for 48 minutes. <laughs> Rossi Harris. <laughs> it, it's the looks. It's the looks that he does. Did you correct those looks with the eyes and all? It's, I, it's just I, hysterical. I think we did have to do a lot of that. And there was a lot of editing. I mean, it, it, uh, we did a lot of takes and a lot of angles and uh, Kareem was great. We loved working with him. We were thrilled to have him. Um, I, I, it, 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 
it took a bit. And, and uh, even with Peter Graves, who was also uh, terrific and very game, but you know, we were pretty precise <clears throat> about where he should be looking you know, when he saying certain lines, when he's, you know, we, we, when he said, have you, says, have you ever seen a grown man naked? We have him look away because that, that, that's a very sensitive uh, 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 situation of, 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 of group, you know, dialogue there. And, and uh, it, it could have easily uh, gone south. <laughs> we got, know? we got the idea of, uh, casting a, he, an athlete because the pilot in Zero Hour was Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch, who had been a famous running back at the University of Wisconsin and then for the Rams. So we thought, wouldn't it be fun to cast a famous athlete and then out him right there on camera? And originally we wrote the uh, part for Pete Rose. And Pete Rose was playing baseball when we were filming. And so the idea came up of Kareem, which was just a gift. We had we were living in Milwaukee when he was Kareem was drafted by the Bucks, and then in '75 when he was uh, traded to the Lakers, we were living out here. And in the media, in the newspaper, almost daily you would read those criticisms of of Kareem that he didn't try except during the playoffs and all that kind of stuff. So we kind of thought this is a phenomenal opportunity for him to, you know, answer his critics. <laughs> Very funny. Were you at all concerned that he would be offended by that being in the script? Not for a second. He, mm -hmm. he, he loved it. And I think he didn't even realize at a time, at the time, how, how much that would change his image, because I think he, he and this is what he told us that uh, you know he was coming off as being aloof and uh, you know no sense of humor and and after this I mean he said it's totally changed his image. Yeah, Joel, you were going to say something. Well, no, I mean I was I was thinking when we we're doing all of this that you know Pete Rose was first and then the second one I think was the idea was famous athlete and the second one uh, was Bruce Jenner. And we never actually made Bruce an offer, but he had said he wanted to do it. And you guys seemed to be okay with that. Then after a week into it, he pulled out of it. And Kareem was the next on the list of famous athletes. And I always wondered why Bruce left. He left to do the Alan I Kahn actually, movie. I, I actually don't have that memory. Bruce Jenner um, auditioned for Stryker. Yeah. And, and he was... Um, I, I just remember he, he never really um, understood that the three of us were doing the casting because he kept <laughs> wanting to know what Howard Koch, you know, would think. And, and uh, uh, you know, but I, I don't, Jim, David, do you remember? I remember, uh, we, I think we went right from uh, Pete Rose to Kareem. In terms uh, of offers, yes. Yeah. But, but Bruce, I, I remember well, Jenner coming in like three different times to read for Stryker. Right. That's well, right. no, he came in twice to read for Stryker, and the third time he came in to read for Elaine. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's well. go to some questions. Let's, <laughs> let's go to some questions from members of our audience. You can put in the chat your question. Please put your location from where you're asking the question. I'll ask them uh, up our guests. Uh, Katie in Iowa says, uh, why don't you think this type of absurdist humor exists that much in today's comedies? Uh, Christy, do you want to take that first and then maybe the guys can jump in on that? It's a thing I think about a lot. And I actually wanted to ask this question, this exact question. I think a lot about movies that couldn't get made today. Animal House, Revenge of the Nerds. And I think about comedians like Jerry Seinfeld and Chris Rock just two to name many, um, who have complained in recent years about how the nature of comedy has changed so drastically that they don't know how to, how to write that same kind of comedy anymore. And I wonder what you guys think about that. Could Airplane get made today? Well, I, I, it could, just without the jokes. But <laughs> <laughs> the main thing is that, you know, it's not the actual humans in the audience that couldn't take it. It's the studio boardrooms, and they're all frightened people. 
So, uh, and you know, I, I think that, yeah, they, it's the studios who are frightened of the of whatever backlash. And so I think the audience are the audiences are suffering because they're not getting any good comedy in the movie. Now, they're, they're, on TV, there's there's some really good comedy. Like, I mean, my favorite is the Impractical Jokers. They're not doing spoof or anything. It's it's a, you know, it's a prank show, but that's funny. I mean, this I think funny is kind of poking out at different places, and maybe it'll come back to the movies. But it's it really is a terrible time for movie comedy. Well, Jerry, you all... you... no, I just say it's a tough time for movies. Uh, uh, it used to be much more of a passion business. And now that all the movies are being made uh, kind of by, by huge corporations and the tech world, um, they just think about it differently. And, and, you know, Airplane got made because Eisner saw something there that he thought, he thought was kind of cool. And, and actually, there are a lot of other executives at the studio that disagreed with him. But he and Katzenberg always thought this was funny and a, and a comedy on an airplane was good, a, a good idea. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say, it was made because of passion, not because numbers lined up or who the cast was or, or, or what the, the people, uh, what the Netflix uh, algorithms are, are telling them about what the audience wants. It, 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 it was made because of a couple of, of executives who thought this would be great. And, and you know, they're, sometimes they were right and sometimes they were wrong, but I think in, in, in general, it was better for movies. Wasn't and I'm so and, glad. And they came from Eisner and Katzenberg and those guys and the executives of Paramount came from movie making. That was their background, movie making. It wasn't, you know, MBAs and business from Wharton. It was from movie making. Well, I'm so glad this opened up the door for the terrific uh, TV show, Police Squad. And, and then, of course, the trilogy of films that you were able to spun mm -hmm. off when the TV series didn't last. Who else have a series that doesn't catch on with the audience, but then you end up with the films being these huge successes afterwards. Um, and that, that had to be very gratifying for the three of you to see that success. We like success. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's better than the, uh, better yeah, than the al alternative. Better than uh, let's take, oh, go ahead. No, I, I just gonna, was going to say we had mixed feelings when when Police Squad went off the air because it, it, I mean we were used to spending uh, a year writing a movie and a, a a year to edit it and and everything and 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 here with Police Squad we were doing one a week and and we just we really couldn't keep up with the pace so. We, you know, it, we we hated to see the ratings go down, but we were kind of we were never that upset with Tony Thermopolis for canceling it. <laughs> that's funny. That's why I hadn't heard that. That's that. It makes me feel better about the cancellation now. Yeah. Glenn in Pasadena asks, uh, says in a few places, you masterfully took some potentially very dark humor and somehow made it work broadly. But were there any setups and jokes that the studio wouldn't let you do or that you had to change? Uh, there was nothing <clears throat> the studio wouldn't let us do. They were, I mean, as opposed to in 2021, it's, uh, they, they, they didn't weigh in at all about the script. It was- uh, Well, that's not exactly true. You know, we had, they had an executive there who helped us with plot stuff. But I think what David is saying is no one said, no, you can't do this. Right. Oh, they helped, you have to do. helped us tremendously with rewriting the script. And we yeah. did all the all those flashbacks with the love story was added uh, under the studio's uh, guidance. And, and they wanted to make sure uh, uh, the original airplane script was on a, uh, it was in black and white and on a prop plane. And they said, no, it's going to be in color and it's got to be on the jet. Uh, Julie Bernstein in West Hills says, my mother, Nora Mirbaum, was the cocaine lady and uh, <laughs> wants to know, if, do you have any particular memory of, of shooting the scene with her that you could share with her daughter, Julie? I thought you were going to say, do you have any memory of doing cocaine? <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't have any memory of it except no. that you know she slept with all of us to get the part. <laughs> Beth, your mom was great. Man. No, she was. Yeah, she was. She was very, very nice and loved. You know, playing against her type. I think. Yeah, this is great. For those who don't remember this scene, she's the scold of the drinking across the aisle and then turns and she, snorts cocaine. She really do, does give the best a disapproving look ever. Yeah, <laughs> That's great. Um, Kevin uh, says, I've always been obsessed with the mirror shot when Robert Stack steps through what you think is his reflection. How did you come up with that gag? We were doing cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> well, bless you for noticing that a lot of people in the film, you know, see the film and don't. And uh, I, I don't know. I just think it was just a, a funny visual idea to us. And it never really got a big laugh. But 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 I, 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 I think we, we were uh, always oh, amused by it. We would we would think up these visual puns and later in Top Secret, like we had station leaving the train uh if, if anybody remembers that but there you know we we were kind of uh paid a lot of attention to visual tricks and like when they had the binoculars and the cows jump over the thing I, you know there we we would we love to do those kind of things and that's where the mirror gag came out of uh the other scene in the film uh bob you you have the dance scene uh, with Julie, can you talk a little bit about um, what went into choreographing that since it's you know not a typical dance scene? Well, we actually, they got a hold of um, Lester Wilson who uh, helped choreograph Saturday Night uh, Fever. And, um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name, the, the Italian sounding John name. Travolta. No, 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 the guy that choreographed it, <laughs> choreographed it. Anyway, he gets most all the tension, but Lester Wilson is the one that gave it the feel. And anyway, Lester came in and uh, uh, Jim Beecham, I think it was, was from like a Disney staff choreographer. And those two worked with Julie and me for about two weeks. And we had the whole scene all choreographed, what we're supposed to do. And when we got on the set and we lined up to do the scene, I walk out to her and we line up this way. And I think Jim said, wait a minute, can't you do it the other way? We got, we got to do it the other way. And everyone was trying to figure out what to do. I felt like this is my one contribution of the film. I said, what about I come up to her, we stalk each other like animals in the jungle and then turn around. And once we're turned around, I throw my jacket, comes back, hits me in the face when I strike the pose. And we did it and it worked. So that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. But then the, the, when I was doing the Gazatsky, the Russian Gazatsky, and I had both legs you know, going out at the same time. And I had, obviously I had wires holding me and someone said, how did you do that? And I told them, I said, well, I really worked out and they believed me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Bob, tell them about the juggling. As we're doing the scene, Jim said, can you juggle? And I said, yeah. And he threw some oranges or balls or whatever they were. And I just started juggling in the scene. So that was just on the spot. We've had a couple of uh, audience members want to ask about uh, Stephen Stucker, the character of Johnny. How much of what he said was ad-libbed, if at all? Well, it was all ad-libbed, but beforehand. I mean, we we could we could never write for Steve. He was in our Kentucky Fried Theater show, and uh, so when we gave we would uh, we called him up on the phone. I remember, and we gave him all the straight lines, like the um, what kind of plane is it? And, he's, and he said over the phone, it's a big, pretty white plane with red stripes. It looks like a big Tylenol, and then we cracked up and we wrote it down, and it went right into the script like that. So he wrote all of his uh, his lines. Uh, Maybe not, um, you know, when, the, when, when he unplugs the lights, that was from a piece of stock footage that we found that actually just was in the stock footage. The, the lights went off on the runway. And so that led us to think, well, how about Steve? Uh, you know, we put the thing of his, uh, he plugs in the thing and says, just kidding. Let's, uh, let's watch that scene that you just described, our, our final clip of the evening. Sure is quiet out there. Uh, too quiet. Looks like a 
picked the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. Sound your alarm bell, now! All right, now, everybody, get in crash position. Put down 30 degrees of flap. All right, now listen to me. Remember your brakes and switches. Get ready to fire it out. He's all over the place. 900 feet up to 1,300 feet. What an asshole. Hold that foot! Put down more flat! Just kidding. <laughs> Strikers, lift your nose! Straighten your wings! Coming in too fast, watch your speed! He's coming right at us! You know, it's Jonathan the... Banks right there. With one of yeah. my favorite lines in the show, 1,800 feet to 300. He's all over the place. What an <laughs> asshole. And who's, who was on, uh, you know, Breaking Bad and, and all of those. And, and who yeah. came up with the idea of doing the laundry? Uh, at that scene? I did. Who remembers? <laughs> yeah, well, that's <laughs> yeah. Right. I watched that. I just watched that clip and had it like post-traumatic stress with about the duck. Because that was a very... <laughs> That was a stunt. It um, well, it was cold. It had uh, the way that they made it come out was like some kind of CO two or something, and it was against my skin. And I had to, I had to not react to the freezing cold on my chest. I had to stay in that. Could not wait to get rid of the duck. I wow. mean, it was a, and I think we only had two of them, right? So if I blew it, it was gone. So it's a, I still, I still get tense. When I see the duck. All that stuff was rigged up by Joel Thurm. <laughs> <laughs> but it was originally a goose, and then it went to a duck. Oh, they're dangerous. They're dangerous, Keith. <laughs> hey, um, uh, Christy and Tim, I want to give you a chance to, to say a bit more here about the film, particularly since you know, we've had a chance to watch the clips, refresh our, our memory uh, about the film. Uh, Christy, any, any final thoughts? It's just, it's so zippy and there are so many great little details and I notice something different every single time I watch it, whether it's something in the background or, you know, just a, a, an eyebrow raise, for example. And then it's been so informative hearing all you guys provide insight, which makes it feel fresh all over again. So that's really cool. I do want to know what Tim's thoughts were though when he first saw the stewardess I speak jive scene. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought that was absolutely hysterical is what I thought. I particularly, look, look, I was not eight years old when this movie came out. I was kind of a grown man. <laughs> so, so, so the jokes were all kind of, kind of landing on me a little bit different. What I do dearly love is all of the little character actors that would go on to become rather, rather significant. Jimmy, Jimmy Walker, of course, is in the movie. He's the windshield guy who's doing the stuff. He had been in Good Times. David Leisure, uh, who would go on to become Joey Zuzu and, and be uh, an empty nest. He's one of the, the Hari Krishna guys. And, and they're like, if you, if you look at that movie, you, you start going, oh, oh, oh. It's just, it's just a, it's full of, of, so good work, Joel. Good work indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and and speaking of those uh, airport uh, terminal scenes, did Robert Stack do his own stunts? Because it looked like he was actually doing that fight stuff as he arrives. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That was, and that was one take. I mean, he did that whole walking in the airport and laying out all those guys in in. There were no cuts in that scene. Including the little thing where he does the, the backward flip yeah. thing over. He did yeah. that? Yeah. He did that. <laughs> That's amazing. And he must have been around 60 at the time that he did yeah. that. I think so. he was in his 50s, I think. Oh, was 50s he? Okay. By then. Well, but so am I. Still, I can't. pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the stunt coordinator was Conrad Pomisano. And he, if you look at it closely, he designed it very cleverly. So 
that could use other stunt people's, you know, energy and and make it look like uh, his. But but yes, I I certainly give uh, Bob a lot of Bob Stack a lot of credit for that. Con Conrad Palmasano was the one that comes up asking for things like grab his head and punch him. Right. Yeah. That guy was the stunt coordinator. That was kind. Oh, that's Almost funny. Yeah. I want to thank all of you for spending so much time with us this evening to talk about Airplane, uh, the writing and directing and all the years that creatively went into um, doing what what became this film and then your, your careers that followed, of course. And uh, Bob, uh, Lorna, thank you both so much. Joel, appreciate your talking about uh, the incredible casting of this film as well. And Tim and Christy, of course, always appreciate it. And you hear them on Film Wake with me regularly. Again, Jerry, David, Jim, thank you all very much. And thank you for this film, which as we hoped with our Film Week and Chill series does make things feel better in what have been some very, very difficult times. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Larry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a terrific conversation. And thank you for joining us on this Film Week and Chill event where we pay tribute to Airplane. And just want to remind you that everyone who contributes to support KPCC and LAS also supports the programs that we do. So thank you so much for all of that, for your membership, your support, and for joining us this evening. Until next time, I'll be talking with you on the radio. Have a great evening.